Hi. Uh, okay. Um, so I, I, the last speaker said something about uh, the British. I'll say something about the French. Uh, the, the title, the title uh, comes from a very famous paper uh, that, that basically started the French New Wave uh, and critiqued kind of cinema at the time. So I'm going to critique database people because that's what I am. I'm a database person. Um, so what is the certain tendency of the database community? Um, basically, it's twofold. Uh, one is that uh, we treat these massively scaled uh, replicated databases as a single database. We kind of assume what's referred to in the literature as a single system image. So even though it's geo-replicated, we kind of think of it as one logical unit of memory for the database. And kind of the second component is that uh, the way we develop client-server applications today, we, we think about uh, data is not being stored until I get an acknowledgement from the database saying, yes, this is in the database, right? We don't think of it at the time of data generation. And so kind of my two, critique, uh, two critiques here are that data is really owned by the clients that generate that data. Um, that data should be able to be used immediately as soon as that data is created. We shouldn't wait till some arbitrary database somewhere on the internet says yes. Um, and kind of the second component here is that uh, we think the database is basically both an optimization and a bottleneck. Um, it's an optimization in that we, we use imperative programming languages to operate on a distributed database uh, and we treat it as just like a shared, a piece of shared memory. We treat it as like distributed shared memory and we read and write to it. Um, this obviously slows down the execution of applications to the speed of the fastest transaction that you can perform on that database. And so this is kind of a, a bad way of thinking about designing systems that have to go to a very large scale, which is where my research is. Um, and so most of my work uh, today is on uh, writing applications that run directly on edge devices that are pushed all the way out to the edge. Um, and so what we need to do is kind of liberate ourselves from this, uh, this view as the database is kind of just, you know, some memory that we can interact with and it's distributed all over the internet. So uh, I come from the database world, you probably don't, or maybe you do. Um, so I will provide some background on what we mean when we talk about consistency in distributed database systems. Um, so consistency models in concurrent programming, in, 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 in this context, distributed programming, are effectively contracts between an application and a database that application is written against. Um, what these contracts say, th these contracts are basically guaranteed rules. Given I you know, follow the rules, I'll get some predictable outcomes. Specifically, uh, if I write some object, am I able to immediately read that object, or will I have to wait some arbitrary amount of time to be able to read that object? Um, this is really important. Uh, to building systems. For instance, if I write an application and I write object A, and then I immediately write object B and B references A in my program, uh, I need my system to guarantee that I have causality, that these operations will happen in the correct order. And we'll see that many systems that we actually use uh, today in reality uh, don't have this guarantee. And so, um, roughly speaking, not to get into the details because it's extremely complex, um, we break consistency models into two categories, um, strong versus weak. Um, strong, uh, an example of a strong model is something like linearizability. This is the strongest correctness criteria for concurrent programming, which basically says that uh, if I write an object, I'll be able to, or the readers will be able to immediately read that object that they've started the operation after it's been committed, and that operations respect the real-time order of events, if such a thing actually exists. Uh, weaker models, such as eventual consistency, which you might have heard of, uh, it's informally specified. It's, it's, it's specified, you'll see on the next slide how informally specified it is, but it places no bound on when updates can be seen. It just says that eventually all of the parties in the system will observe all the same events. This is a very weak criteria to use as the cornerstone of building something. And so you see this is very uh, informally specified. It basically says, you know, at some arbitrary time in the future when updates <coughs> stop happening, you'll see all of them. Well, that's not very good. Um, so this is a weak model, but we use it all over the place, and client-server applications basically is this model. And so one would ask, why would we pick a weak model um, to build applications on when stronger models do exist? We have to find them. And the problem is this theoretical result, um, um, this impossibility proof um, from Eric Burr, that basically says that when the net, if I have a piece of data that's replicated multiple places <laughs> geographically, if I cannot communicate between all of the parties, I have to sacrifice consistency if I want to remain available. And so what this means is um, I can have a strong view where everybody sees the exact same thing in the exact same order, but it means that if one person is down, or I don't know if they're down because there's another impossibility proof that shows that it's impossible to know if somebody is down, um, how it, the system needs to give that up 
if it needs to stay answering requests. And most of our systems do need availability. So to give you an example so you can understand this, uh, I have an airline reservation system. I place a copy of it in Europe. I place a copy in the US. I can currently have two users request to each of their local replicas to reserve the last seat on a plane. And if the replicas can't communicate with each other, I have to make a choice. I can favor consistency by preventing the plane from being booked because I can't communicate between the two copies, and that gives me a consistent view. Or I can favor availability, which means that the reservation will succeed on both, and now the plane will be double booked. And so then I have to repair things after the fact. Um, and so for the rest of the time, so now kind of with that background of the challenges, you know, this, these are the challenges of the, these are the real world challenges of a distributed systems researcher, I suppose. Uh, now with that background, uh, we'll kind of just look at uh, analogies in the real world to eventual consistency and kind of try to figure out if the physical world, the way we kind of operate is, as people, um, does it favor availability over consistency? And the answer, I think, is pretty clear. And so, uh, the first thing I want to think about is uh, recorded knowledge. So, um, if I'm an author and I'm writing a book, maybe this is an informational book on eventual consistency, because apparently I'm a, an expert in that field, I may, you know, write that information down, and while I'm writing this book, I'm creating a replica that is incomplete and stale. Um, that replica will exist, and that replica will be potentially outdated. So the artifact itself will be potentially outdated because as I'm writing this book, I may be thinking of new things, they're not in the book yet, and so this book is kind of like a replica of my copy of that information that's potentially growing, either it, that's incomplete or growing stale over time. Now, uh, when we think about how these replicas communicate with each other, they do this through asynchronous message passing. Um, and so if I want to communicate with uh, you know, somebody out there, uh, Tomas, for instance, uh, I will send a message containing some information, um, and this message could be arbitrarily delayed or dropped. Um, I could say something, and he could be on his phone, and not paying attention, and not hear what I'm saying, but he, he did see what I'm saying, but, you know, even that process is asynchronous, right? And so we have this notion that messages can be arbitrarily delayed or dropped. Um, this is what makes distributed systems challenging, is, is this problem here. And, uh, you know, examples of this could be a letter that I've written that's sent via the Postal Service. Uh, this is international, it may take a while. The information, again, even in that letter, that artifact is getting stale over time while it's in transit. Um, text messages as well, you know, if you don't have your read receipts on, because you like to be mean or something, you know, text messages are another way of doing this, maybe telephone calls. Hmm. Now, um, all of this information, um, is stored in, uh, we, we think about my information. So I'm writing this book on eventual consistency. I am, the information I derive is the primary site for that information. It's kind of the primary copy. And what I'm doing is I'm creating, I'm coordinating updates to that information, and I'm creating copies of it by creating replicas, creating these artifacts. Um, now, as I learn new things and I pass that along to other people, that information can be cached along the path. But I don't know whether that information, I have no control over the consistency of that information. And so to give you an example of kind of this caching idea, um, if I'm walking to a restaurant, or so I'm walking back to the metro after this wonderful workshop, and I don't know how to get there, and so maybe I have some local or incomplete memory of how to get back to the metro stop I used. And then maybe I can use this map that they provided in the bag, but we don't know when this was printed. It could be stale, it could be outdated. Um, there's a ton of construction on campus. If you haven't noticed, I got lost yesterday and was late. And so this is an example of an outdated printed map. And then maybe what I have to do is I have to use the USGS information from Google Maps. Again, that could also be stale, but in this contrived example, we'll consider it not. So then, if you buy into that, you have to say, well, what is a database? What really is a database? These are the questions, we like the big science questions we like to ask. And so the database is kind of just like a network of people that communicate that have copies of information. That information is sometimes the source of truth because they came up with it, or it's potentially stale. And what we do is when we think about creating a database, what we're doing is we're just taking a bunch of people's knowledge and we're reducing it kind of to a single node if we visualize this as graph. And so if I wanted to create the most contrived, geo-replicated, eventually consistent database of all information in the world, divided by country, then I could just take everybody's information in that country and, and have a database for every country in the world, and then boom, there's my geo-replicated Facebook-like database with what everybody thinks about everything. And so Wikipedia can be seen as an example of this, because Wikipedia is kind of a bunch of experts in some field commenting on some article. That article is potentially up-to-date, it may not be up-to-date. 
It depends, you know, if it's like Game of Thrones, maybe. If it's something like consistency, probably not, because people don't do that in their free time. And so, why do we optimize? And the reason that we optimize is because it is very expensive to go get information from the source all the time, the actual source. Um, you know, if I am really interested in communicating sequential processes, it's going to be very inconvenient if every time I want to do something with it, I have to call Tony Hoare on the phone and talk to him. And so what do I do? Well, I use his book, right? Because he distilled his knowledge into this artifact. And uh, the more copies of something we create, this introduces more challenges on how we maintain a consistent view across all of those copies. And so you can see that content delivery network. So you, every time you want to go to CNN, you don't go to CNN's primary server in the US and some Virginia data center. No, you get a bunch of cached information from some data center in Europe. And then when CNN has a breaking article because Donald Trump did something dumb, then what you have to do is you have to you know, find a way to evict those caches, to validate those caches as quickly as possible so that you can get the new information. Um, and so where my interest comes in this is that uh, we work on IoT and mobile. Um, centralized approach for this doesn't scale. There's too much data. Um, the amount of devices that we're anticipated to have is much higher than the amount of data centers, uh, data center capacity we'll have, mainly uh, due to power requirements. Um, and finally, the, uh, where our research is, is that programming models today that people use to build applications rely on the centralized approach. So we know the centralized approach won't scale. We use programming models like C and Rust and things like this. These are inherently centralized programming models on local memory. Uh, and so basically, um, what we're arguing is that we want to do edge computation. Um, if we think about edge computation, the real challenge is that we want to solve kind of the database as a constraint satisfaction problem says, given everybody owns their data, how do I know where to send requests when I need to get some data? How do I know where the copies of that data are? How do I know that if I'm talking to a replica of that data, that data is within an acceptable amount of staleness? How do I know I can service that request in a particular amount of time because applications have, are latency sensitive? Ideally, we want to minimize both staleness and latency, uh, which is very difficult to do. And finally, if I make multiple requests to multiple copies, how do I know which copy is more up to date? So if I have a register that can be zero or one, it goes back and forth, how do I know if I get one, the zero is newer or it's older? So uh, I'm going to talk about some proposed solutions just very quickly. I, can talk, I can't go into a lot of detail, but um, one idea that we have is using what we refer to as virtual <coughs> data structures. So these are abstract data types that encapsulate the notion that they are merging to the correct result. So if I have a copy of something and I'm working on it, and you have a copy of something and you're working on it, we can kind of merge those changes together. One example of this is some work by our group on, on what are referred to as conflict-free replicated data types. And effectively, what these data types do is they capture a notion of causality and concurrency. So under concurrency, they have a conflict resolution policy. And under causality, they can say, that object is newer than me. And then we merge these together. Now, uh, data structures aren't enough. We know, unless, I don't know, unless you're a Lisper, you can argue differently, I guess. But uh, data structures aren't usually enough to build uh, real nice applications like video games. And so what do we need? Well, we need a programming abstraction around data types. Um, ideally, we want this same mergeable property that we have on the individual data types to carry through to application outcomes. And so uh, one example is some work that we've been doing on making correct by construction distributed applications. These can express very little, so not very expressive, but they're correct by construction. They will never go wrong if failures happen, if messages are delayed, dropped, whatever. Um, and the way we do this is we track a bunch of provenance information in the outcomes of programs so we can reason about the results. Like, was this, is this copy newer than this copy? Does this copy relate to this other copy? Um, and finally, kind of a, the, the, one of the final components is, can we blur this distinction between clients and servers? Like, what really is the difference between clients and servers? Um, Clients effectively own their own data and should be able to communicate directly with other clients. We should have a way to do this. This is a way to enable scalability. We have to remove single points of contention. Um, but we need servers, right? Because servers kind of model business entities in our world. Um, and servers are really important because sometimes you have to charge a credit card and you can't let everybody do it and you can't let it happen more than once. <laughs> so, you know, we kind of need some sort of centralization there. And so one example of this is Skype. So if you don't know, Skype was uh, kind of a paramount application when it came out, completely peer-to-peer. -peer. 
Uh, they actually didn't need centralization of Skype at all until they needed to add authentication in the address book. But all of the communication in Skype is peer-to-peer. -peer. So it's kind of a novel thing if you didn't know. And so uh, I have a little bit of time left, and so I'm going to just uh, talk about some stuff that's not in the paper that I've been thinking about uh, as it, because uh, I've been having some conversations, and, uh, and this has come up. So anybody in the room who has kind of a physics background is going to say, you know, you're arguing all this weak consistency stuff. What about causality, right? So causality is interesting um, because in the original uh, presentation of this work, we argued that like kind of the way information is replicated in the world is kind of eventually consistent, right? But we know, in fact, that that is not true because the world you know that inhabits us, the physics we know today, uh, we have things like special relativity, general relativity. We have this notion of light cones, which are what events can influence other events. We know for a fact under the current, you know, under classical mechanics, that, that uh, causality is what defines time, and it's really the causal relationships between events. It's, there's no time outside of that. And so, this has been well studied in distributed systems. Um, Leslie Lamport wrote a Paramount paper in 78, um, later winning the Turing Award, um, on what's referred to as the happens before relationship in distributed systems. And this is a, an efficient encoding of saying that some event definitely came before some other event, right? And so um, this allows us to reason about how updates propagate and things like this. And so the problem with causality, and this is an area of research that we work on, the problem with causality is that while it is extremely beneficial because it allows us to reason about cause and effect in large-scale distributed applications, it is extremely problematic to capture. Um, in, you know, causality is broken into two camps, uh, uh, potential and uh, explicit. Explicit says that if some event B happens, or some event C happens, it can explicitly tag either A or B or A and B to say that those events were causal influencers. Potential causality says, well, no, every possible event that came before this is a potential influencer of that event. And so potential is really expensive, but explicit requires a clever encoding mechanism that also can be very expensive in the pathological case. And so basically what researchers have done for the last 15 years is they say, how can we efficiently encode causality without introducing too many false dependencies? So that doesn't seem like, you know, this is kind of driving, going off the guardrails, right? Just trying to figure out how we can minimize something and get the best outcome. And so there is a model of consistency that's stronger than eventual consistency that's referred to as causal consistency, which says that data in a database changes based on causal relationships. So wouldn't this be a better model to use? Um, and so I don't know, maybe the audience is the answer. Uh, I don't know, and I think not, because data, um, I think, has decay. I think that data kind of gets invalid over time. I think other data kind of removes the need for particular pieces of information to be known. And I think that data kind of expires. And the current formalism for causality states that, no, we need to either explicitly track that we knew something and purposely forgot about it indefinitely, or store that information indefinitely. And so maybe that model isn't completely compatible, and so maybe there's something that's in between eventual and causal. Okay, and so I'll give one analogy and wrap up. Um, so causality by example, um, to give you a notion of what causal consistency would say. Um, if I learned a bunch of rules about driving, and then I, I took a test, and that test enabled me to pass because I learned the rules, and then I got a license, and then I could drive, and then I renew that license, these are events that are causal in, causally influencing each other. Now, uh, what does causality imply? Causality will imply that I don't have the license unless I took the test, which means that I learned the rules and I learned them well enough to pass. Now, what does causal consistency imply? So causal consistency implies that if I have a driver's license number that I can recall, I should be able to recall all the rules. That's kind of technically what the causal relationship implies when applied to causal consistency. And so maybe that's not true because I couldn't tell you a single rule. But maybe, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't be driving around me, but that's another story. And so to wrap up, um, what am I saying? So there's been some adoption of these ideas. Um, for a while, Uber used to put all of the, so if you know this drive, drive, ride sharing company, they've been in the news a little bit lately, if you haven't heard. Um, what they do is they used to store the canonical state for each ride on the device itself. And that meant that they could have entire data centers go away, chaos, guerrilla style, and they could bootstrap data centers by getting the data off the device. Now this is challenging for a variety of reasons. If, you're, if you know anything about security, you'll know that putting the canonical state about how much money you should be charged on the client's device, the driver's device, is probably not the smartest thing to do unless you can do it very well. Um, but we're seeing some adoption. Um, 
Data center focused designs are limiting. Um, bandwidth, bandwidth is getting better. Pricing is bad because tier one carrier charges. Um, power requirements, all sorts of things. Um, and we can't build a data center everywhere. Uh, there are some places in the world that still use sneaker net, um, which is transmitting <laughs> data via your shoes by walking it there. Um, there are uh, USB uh, systems. Uh, in some countries, banking happens via SMSs. Um, we can't assume, like you do when you live in San Francisco, that everybody has an iPhone and they're all using like an app to send each other money. That doesn't exist in the rest of the world or a lot of places in the world. And so uh, what we would like to see happen is we would like to see changes in programming models and abstractions to allow us to build pervasively replicated, massively large scale systems. And so we're doing some work and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get there. And so, uh, thank you. Um, thanks for the talk. Thank you. So I should start by saying I used to be a systems researcher. In fact, by some measures I still am, and uh, or you count. Um, so I thought this was a really bold paper. It has an expansive vision about what the world's information systems could become. Uh, like a lot of systems people, I include myself sometimes, I think that there's a danger of rushing very headlong towards a bold new target and not thinking too much about what is the space of systems people need to build. You know, and obviously that space is changing all the time and, and technology can change what that space can do. Um, so what I want to ask is, uh, you know, which system exactly is just going to help? Does a bigger scale mean bigger value? It was significant that your presentation said at the beginning, I'm interested in going to really big scale. But your paper did not mention that at any point. So I think that's maybe a, a symptom of this, this, this sort of tendency to not, not think too much about um, what are we at, who are we trying to benefit here? Are we going to be throwing out uh, to quote myself, uh, I'll be throwing out some program babies with the low stability uh, so, so, um, so, I'm going to say that there's an unfortunate tendency of database community to insist on strongly consistent semantics, and this is the uh, I'm going to claim that an unfortunate tendency of the systems community is to disregard both the application and the program. So what this community cares about is bigger numbers, whether they have bigger availability or scalability, is optimizing for some few chosen metrics. And the application itself is very quickly abstracted away. It's an assumption um, that the only important applications are those that are infinitely big. And, uh, so um, rather than motivating a new programming model in terms of the applications that it would benefit, we ended up saying, let's extrapolate to the limit. We have asymptotes, we say, um, uh, that, I mean, in, the, in, your, in your paper, there's mention of asymptotes and thinking about computing the big systems, uh, which makes sense if you're just going to scale. But if you're thinking about a program model in, in more general terms, then it might not be the best thing. So one of the more, um, one of the few things my PhD supervisor taught me was that uh, he just one day said to me, uh, yeah, not very many things, it's true. He said, Paradigms don't scale. And then I went away and thought about that for a few months. And then I figured out what he meant. Um, so one of the most recent sort of things in this in this vein is uh, if any of you read uh, Frank Mc, Frank McSherry's work, um, he has a paper called Scalability, but at what cost? So he's saying, well, actually, the systems community has been moving away on making these massively scalable systems, except they forgot to measure how fast they actually go. So uh, he ran a bunch of different uh, workloads from real systems papers on just his laptop and found that it was faster, a lot faster, an awful lot of the time. Uh, so that's another kind of uh, example of maybe throwing out babies with bath water. Um, let me try and get down to where I was in my notes. Um, so there's also this idea that, well, the real world doesn't have a single image, um, so maybe our systems don't need to have a single image either. But actually, the real world does have a single image in many cases. For example, you know, maybe I'm, I really want an application that, it's a common use case of computers, right? I have something that used to be a physical object, and I move it into this virtual domain, which is so let's say I'm running a hotel and I have a, a ledger of who is staying in my hotel, all the room bookings. It's a very simple example, but most applications are simple, and we struggle to make even simple applications work with good, you know, with good economic value. So uh, the physical world is great this because I have a single image which is a book in front of me, and I have some nice music <coughs> protocol which is the, uh, 
electro, uh, electromagnetic forces and weak nuclear force. Don't let me put my hand in front of the book. You know, <laughs> right? Uh, and so, and so actually, single image is wonderful for this, right? So, so that's actually what people want. And I, one of the great things about databases, I would argue, is that they don't have a strong distinction between users and programmers. So. Uh, they've always database systems as a sort of design discipline, if you can call it that, have always had to worry about how they're going to be used, what the interaction is like. Obviously, SQL is, is one answer, but but the fact that the database has offered this idea of transactions, I still transactions are wonderful. If only could have transactions everywhere, because you know I often want to do compound operations, and oh, I need an, an, a simple abstraction that my poor little brain can understand about how compound operations ought to work. I think databases give that, and okay, it doesn't scale, but. Many you know, so, so this wouldn't be an issue if we could just pick the appropriate technology. All the technology goes where the hype is. So that's where, that's why I worry that you know, whatever is hot uh, in the, in the picture of technology will influence the things that are pushed to the end user, whether whether or not it's a sort of sound technical decision. So that's um, okay. Where have I got to? Oh, I've done my hotel thing. I've done my <laughs> Maybe, oh, so, so at the end, I wrote, I wrote all this stuff, which you can see in due course, and then at the end I thought, you know, maybe I'm missing the point, because um, there is certainly, there's a big vision there, and the idea of, of uh, the, the world of the sort of data store, and having individual, you know, whatever database you build, it's just like a little cluster optimization, like this idea that you, you develop both in the talk and in the paper. Uh, I think there is, there is a place for that. Uh, it's more about putting it in the right uh, context. Um, so if interplanetary scale is, is, is possible, does that mean small scale is dead? Um, and I think that this work is sort of half asking that sort of question. And my response is to, let's, let's ask that question fully. So um, thanks everyone for listening to my roundings. Um, <laughs> we've got some questions, do we? So I think we've, we've got, um, when, when people get really hungry, then they'll <laughs> run away. But I think we should have a few minutes. So maybe I'll have a one, one sort of thought that maybe expands on what you were saying with the sort of, we have either, where, where we have very sort of coarse grained models. I, I felt that very much when, when talking about time in distributed systems because you always have like immediately, eventually and never. But really like when I'm booking a ticket, eventually and never aren't very useful. I'm sort of, right. there's like hour-ish. You want to <coughs> and I, I, I sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know this is really hard to say in any formal sense, but maybe we should have like distributed systems where hour-ish is, is, a, is a valid. Yeah, yeah, so there is like a notion of like, yeah, so I'll make one comment. So a lot of, there, there's a couple papers about reservation systems uh, from like the 80s, 70s or 80s, where they are built on eventual consistency. But event, this like eventual really isn't eventual. So uh, there's there's some, we're working on a paper, there's a lot of previous work on like the quantifying how stale something really can be, right? And so uh, we've done some preliminary work and so Peter Bayless has kind of a really nice study of this that shows that in practice, because uh, systems will periodically communicate with each other in a particular pattern under a particular schedule, that you really do have a map. You really know you can quantify that map. Um, we're doing some work that, so we, we've done some work on databases where you say, like, make this change, and it's kind of eventual, but like, if it gets to be too long, then the system has to pause. It has to wait until it can synchronize. And so I think, like, in practice, I think it's, I think it's valuable to explore the extremes and see like what you can push in either direction. But like more practically speaking, the way we really build systems is is this way, is probabilistically bounded. Um, but I, I'll give you, uh, let me just give two examples. So I had a slide I didn't show because I d thought I didn't have enough time. So uh, my company, my previous company, before I started my PhD, built a database. That database ended up being used by the Danish National Healthcare Service and the NHS. And so they use this in Denmark to manage prescriptions. So it's eventually consistent. And so what that means is that there is a probability that when you go to fill your prescription, two concurrent fills can happen at the same time. But in practice, this doesn't happen because one person has a card, they have a prescription, and they have to physically go into a pharmacy. Um, 
we also worked with another company that's an Invent365 in the UK, and they do betting on eventual consistency. And they just know that the system is going to stabilize within like three minutes, and so you just don't pay all bets until three minutes, because you know the system's stabilized. And so a lot of these people are, are building systems this way because they want to exploit availability, but they do need some guarantees, and so they kind of write an application around the warts to get the guarantees. But you agree that eventual consistency is not always the best choice for uh, the Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, for a lot of things you need causality, um, really. Especially yeah, in the we're, financial we're, sector probably. I mean, causality implies referential integrity, which means that you can have references between things, and that's kind of a core concept in building applications, and so in many cases you need causality unless the application is trivial. Yeah. But providing causality at scale is very difficult. So that's kind of still a research question. Is, uh, to your opinion, is consistency a synonym of uh, fragility? Is consistency a synonym for fragility? Yeah. For anti for fragility. Yeah, fragility. For fragility. Fragility. Wow, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I have to. I think I have to think about that more. I don't know. What What is your opinion? I mean, in your examples, like uh, okay, if you, if you if you have a network partition and you want consistency, everything is broken. So it's very fragile to a single network partition. So in this example, for instance, it's a pure synonym. Uh, and in the other examples you mentioned, it, it, I had the feeling that it's yeah. Very so I mean, to your anti-fragility point, like so, I love the talk. Uh, I love the idea. We are building, so we, we imagine like, so when you have a central server, so if I have two servers that are replicating, or three servers so I can get a quorum, I guess, but if I have three servers that are replicating, clients are talking to these. You have to do this leader election. You've got to be able to talk to the leader. You have to be able to get consensus across them. And so when we started thinking about, like, we don't call it anti-fragility, but we think about this concept, what we're saying is like, well, why don't we pervasively replicate peer-to-peer -peer and use, com use other peers to facilitate communication through peers? And like, well, we get a lot more tolerance defaults this way. Uh, and we found out there's a lot of interesting properties when you start changing kind of the networking infrastructure and looking at how to build systems on top of this a different way. So, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's a symptom, but, uh, I, but I definitely think that there's a strong relationship between the two, without a doubt. But I will make a point that I wanted to make about your talk about chaos engineering. The only thing, the really important part about chaos engineering, in my opinion, is that developers develop in an environment where the failures are injected. So if you just injected failures in, in a company's infrastructure, um, the software may not handle that. And then they have, to, they have to simulate that scenario locally to build software that can tolerate that. The important part is it's like institutional to the lowest level. They basically say, when you're writing your code on your laptop, it's in an environment where failures can be injected. So you naturally just live with failures. You have to like consider coming in one day, my development environment doesn't work. And so that's like kind of a really big departure from the way we normally think about building software. And that's the reason that approach succeeds. So maybe we need more of that. And I think maybe we need more of lunch as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, if you're, if you're